Acting Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and the Pacific. He's also the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Southeast Asia. He's fairly new in this position, but he's not new to Asia. Uh, I think most of us have, have met him along the way. Uh, Ambassador Marcial just returned from three years in Indonesia where he was a driving force in the comprehensive partnership engagement with Indonesia and also I think hosted President, uh, uh, helped host uh, President Obama two times. And before that he was the, uh, was Deputy Secretary for uh, Southeast Asia and also the U.S.'s first ambassador to ASEAN. Uh, and and uh, Scott has also worked as, uh, was involved in the mid-90s in opening the embassy in Vietnam and earlier did a tour in, uh, in uh, the Philippines. So Ambassador Marcial, thank you very much for joining us for lunch. We look forward to hearing your thoughts on, on the Asian architecture. Thanks, Murray. Appreciate it. Murray and I have known each other for a long time. It's good to be back and, and see a lot of friends um, who I haven't seen, some of you I haven't seen for quite a while. Um, and Murray's introduction suggests that I should know something about the subject, which worries me a little bit, but we'll see. Um, thanks again. Thanks very much to CSIS. And I know there were three different teams in CSIS working to organize a symposium, which obviously a lot of interest in the region, which is great. Um, let me try to talk a little bit about the, the U.S. engagement in the region and, and, and the rebalance uh, and how it links to and interrelates with the regional architecture and the upcoming summits, particularly next month. Um, I have to say, uh, Danny Russell, our Assistant Secretary, uh, sends his apologies. He would dearly like to be here giving this speech, uh, I know. Uh, particularly because right now he is wedged in a middle seat on a night flight between Jakarta and Beijing. So I, I know he would much rather be here. Uh, but, but Danny's been out in, in Seoul, Tokyo, uh, uh, Brunei, Jakarta, and I think just left Jakarta for Beijing uh, and then back next week. Um, so for me and for us, the APEC and EAS summits next month really highlight both the importance of the region and the importance of the evolving regional architecture. And you all know very much why we're so focused on Asia. The numbers, you know, a third of the world's population, 25% of its GDP, 27% of its exports. Um, and increasingly, as Secretary, as former Secretary Clinton like used to say, um, it's a part of the world with which we need to partner to solve regional and global problems and to create opportunities. So the U.S. absolutely recognizes and appreciates the importance of the region. Uh, we've long been a Pacific nation, and President Obama has repeatedly emphasized the U.S. commitment to engaging intensively with the region, the so-called rebalance. And the idea of the rebalance is fundamentally a commitment by the United States to devote the time, the energy, and the resources needed to engage fully and effectively with a region that's already important and that is likely to become even more important in global affairs. And as Secretary Kerry put it recently, President Obama has made a strategic commitment to rebalance our interest in investments in Asia. Secretary Kerry in Tokyo, I think it was April of this year, when he was talking about the rebalance, he said, we're talking about a 21st century Pacific partnership in which the United States works bilaterally and multilaterally with the nations of the region to try to solve problems and create opportunities. So one key element of this rebalance, of this intense engagement, is to strengthen our already close ties with our five treaty allies. Japan, Korea, Australia, Thailand, and the Philippines. These alliances have safeguarded regional peace and security uh, for the past half century, and they provide the foundations for the stability upon which the entire region has enjoyed uh, strong economic growth and peace for many years. So part of the rebalance is to continue to work every day to make these relationships even stronger and closer. And another important part of the rebalance, and something I certainly spent a lot of time on in Jakarta, is deepened engagement with new partners. New partnerships 
with countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, while also investing in more established relationships, countries like Singapore, Brunei, and New Zealand, as well as the Pacific Islands. And here we're talking about a broad range of areas we're working together. It's not just security, it's not just trade, important as those are, energy, the environment, health, you name it. China is a very critical partner for us. The world benefits from a stable and prosperous China that assumes the responsibilities of a mature power and plays a constructive role in world affairs. During the Sunnylands meetings early this year, Presidents Obama and Xi committed to building a positive relationship that will produce tangible benefits both for the two nations but also for the world. Another key priority for us, uh, and I know this was emphasized this morning, is to increase trade and economic growth. So we're working with our APEC partners toward a seamlessly integrated regional economy. And my colleague Bob Wong, I think, will be speaking in a few hours here, and we'll go into more detail about APEC. We're working very hard on a TPP agreement that will create a rules-based, high-quality trading system that brings greater prosperity to the United States and the region. And we're working in addition to the TPP, bilaterally and multilaterally, to reduce barriers to trade and investment and to create opportunities in areas such as renewable energy. Under the Expanded Economic Engagement, or E3, initiative, we've made progress in some very concrete joint activities launched by leaders last November to expand trade and investment. We're working toward agreements on trade facilitation, information communications technology, and shared principles for international investment. We're also working, and this gets to the values question, we're always also working to empower the people of Asia to take a full role in determining their own future, ensuring their right to have a voice in their nation's development. So part of our partnership involves working with the nations of Asia to build a region where people enjoy full rights and freedoms, the rule of law, uh, and the benefits of democracy. Um, and underpinning this, all of this, is our continuing work to maintain a peaceful and stable region, deter conflict, and diffuse tension. And again, this is all part of the rebalance. As I said earlier, our presence and security partnerships have for many years supported a peaceful and stable region and created an environment that facilitates and supports growth and development. We continue to do that. Still, challenges remain, most notably North Korea, where we're working with our Asian partners to help the North Koreans realize that they need to abide by their international commitments. We're working with our partners in the region on this and other challenges, such as longstanding territorial disputes, where a misunderstanding could derail the impressive economic progress that we've seen. So to achieve all of these goals of the rebalance of the intensive engagement, how are we doing this? Well, we're engaging intensively, bilaterally and multilaterally. And how are we doing that? Well, first and foremost, through diplomacy. We are showing up. All right? Five or six years ago, when I traveled in the region, I used to hear complaints. You guys aren't showing up at X, Y, or Z. We're showing up. We're showing up where we're supposed to show up consistently at high levels. That's a big part, a really important part of engagement. Uh, obviously, through the trade negotiations like TPP and other things I mentioned, uh, the security engagement and so on, very importantly, increasing people-to-people -people ties, hugely important part of, of closer relations between the United States and the Asia-Pacific region is, is bringing our people closer together through education, exchanges, and other people-to-people -people ties. And of course, one key part of the whole rebalance effort of the engagement is to intensify our work with the regional institutions and to work with other nations in the region to build a regional architecture, to set regional norms, and to create a level playing field for cooperation in which every country's voice matters and everyone plays by the same rules. So this is the link, the specific link, between our rebalance or intensified engagement and these upcoming summits. Um, to ensure our partnership with the region succeeds, we really need to have work toward agreement on the rules of the road for the region. 
Uh, forums like ASEAN, ASEAN Regional Forum, East Asia Summit, APEC, really are designed to help all of us solve problems and to create opportunities. And really, over the last four to five years, we've stepped up our, our engagement, our work with all these institutions significantly. ASEAN is the center of regional institutions. We have supported uh, a, a central role for ASEAN, and we're investing in it heavily as a critical partner. Uh, we've had a good relationship with ASEAN for many years, but in the last four to five years, we've definitely intensified it. We signed the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. Uh, Secretaries Clinton and Kerry have participated in every annual ASEAN Regional Forum meeting. Uh, we established a mission to ASEAN with a resident ambassador, Ambassador David Carden, in Jakarta. We began and continue annual leader-level summits with our ASEAN counterparts, and I know that President Obama is looking forward to the next summit uh, next month in Brunei. Within the ASEAN context, we've been working also on the Lower Mekong Initiative, working with a sub-region. Uh, to reduce the, the development gap, which is very important for ASEAN, and to build capacity in areas like education, energy, and the environment, connectivity, and health care. Um, so we support ASEAN centrality. We'll continue to work with ASEAN directly, but also with the other uh, institutions or fora that are centered around ASEAN. Uh, ARF, ASEAN Regional Forum, the region's oldest and broadest security forum, holds about 25 events annually on, on everything from nonproliferation and disarmament to disaster relief. We participate very actively in those uh, and will continue to do so. We joined the East Asia Summit in 2010, and President Obama uh, began attending the summits uh, in 2011 in, in Bali in November of 2011. Uh, we see the EAS as the region's premier forum for leaders to discuss political and strategic issues. So in the first two EAS meetings, President Obama and the other leaders discussed ways to increase cooperation on a wide range of uh, pressing challenges, and we expect similar discussions this year. Um, as you know, the idea, original idea of EAS was that the, a little bit free form so that the leaders could raise issues. So if something happens, you know, five days before the summit, the leaders aren't bound or, or constrained by an agenda that was set three months earlier. So that's a key part of the EAS. Of course, one of the issues that has been discussed in the EAS, uh, likely will be discussed again this year, is the South China Sea, particularly the territorial disputes. Um, again, while we don't take a position on the competing legal claims based on the land features, we do have an interest in upholding international law, freedom of navigation and the absence of coercive measures. So we've consistently and will continue to consistently support efforts to negotiate a code of conduct that would establish norms for, of behavior for all involved. We look at APEC as the premier forum for economic cooperation in the region. I mentioned earlier my colleague Bob Wong will speak to this in more detail later. Uh, but briefly, we've been working with our partners to um, see how we can shape APEC and EAS into effective complementary venues for cooperation on issues ranging from food security to women's empowerment. Uh, and one way we've done this is to, is to recognize areas where we can leverage the experience and the capacity of APEC to our expand our activities to include three ASEAN nations that are not yet members of APEC. I mentioned TPP earlier. The TPP will be a far-reaching trade agreement that brings together some of the largest and fastest growing economies of the Pacific Rim. It also is part of the broader effort to ensure the adoption of a regional economic and trade architecture that's rules-based and provides an open, fair, and transparent framework. So let me conclude with a few, by, by re-emphasizing a couple of key points. The United States is committed to deep and broad engagement with Asia on a full range of issues. We've increased our engagement in recent years and will sustain that high level. Our active participation in the upcoming APEC and EAS summits will reinforce this commitment. And our commitment is to work with partners bilaterally and multilaterally to maintain the peaceful, stable environment that has been so conducive for growth and development for so many years and to address 
new challenges, and take advantage of new opportunities. To succeed in this goal, we really need a framework for countries to work together, to approach each other as equals in the spirit of mutual respect and to set rules to which we all adhere. So we'll continue to work with our partners and the institutions in the region to shape and build an effective regional architecture that supports our shared interests in peace, stability, and growth, as well as our shared values of freedom and cooperation. Next month's APEC Leaders Meeting, EAS Summit, and the U.S. ASEAN Summit, along with numerous bilateral and other meetings that will take place on the margins, are really opportunities for us both to address challenges in the region, but also to continue to build and shape the Pacific Partnership and the regional architecture that we think is so critical to the continued success of the region. Thank you very much. Be happy to take a few questions. Thank you, thank you very much, Scott, for that uh, comprehensive overview of, of, uh, of the U.S. Uh, position, views on, on the uh, emerging Asian architecture. So, like Scott said, he's ready to take a few questions. Michael. Uh, Michael Martin from CRS. We had a question earlier about budget, but I'm not going to worry about that. I think that's a moot point. But related to that, a couple other th concerns. Um, first, resources, time, and coordination. First, with all these meetings, you said ARF has 40 plus, and uh, APEC has hundreds, I think, and uh, ADMM, we said dozens of things going on there. One, do you feel you have the personnel and resources in state and in the other agencies to actually to uh, engage in all these meetings? Second, time, uh, I've heard before there's sort of Sherpa fatigue, that after they've had all these meetings, when they come back, they don't really have time to implement or follow up on commitments or, or activities talked about at these fora. And then third, coordination between agencies. How, uh, what is being done to make sure that a commitment made at ADMM Plus isn't going to run contrary to something else promised at an EAS event, and you can do all the permutations? Okay, thanks, good questions. Um, the short answer to the first part of the question is yes. I mean, you know, I'd be lying to you if I'd say, you know, the budget cuts don't hurt. Obviously, they, 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 they do. But so far, what I've seen is that, um, you know, we're able, for example, in Jakarta, um, through July at least when I was there, we had a whole series of APEC meetings. And we had very good representation, not from just from state and USTR, but from a, a range of US agencies. So yeah, people are cutting back here and there that they can, but fundamentally we are able to show up and devote the time and, and, and the effort uh, to these things. Um, and uh, in terms of um, Sherpa fatigue, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to rule out that it, you know, and say it never happens, but in my experience, there's pretty good follow-up. We have pretty good systems in place where people report back. And on the third thing on coordination between agencies, I, I can't really go into a long answer because I've got to run off to an interagency meeting. To, <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm being half in jest. I mean, I actually am going to an interagency meeting in an hour or two to talk about coordination. And, and it is, I mean, it's really an advantage we all, those of us in government, like to joke about interagency coordination. But in fact, we actually do have pretty good interagency coordination, and, and the national security staff and, and others do a really good job of, you know, bringing people together and making sure that we're all coordinated. It can always be better, but I actually think it's quite good. Other questions? Lex? Thank you. Lex Riefau with the Brookings Institution. Uh, Scott, I didn't hear you mention the Asian Development Bank. Uh, is that not part of the Asian architecture that we care about? <laughs> I love the Asian Development Bank, Lex. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, it, I didn't mention it. You're right. It wasn't, you know, a, a conscious decision to leave it out so much, um, but because it's, uh, uh, you know, a multilateral uh, bank. Certainly, we work with ADB quite closely. Uh, it's important. Um, and, and I think, you know, I would, I guess, leave it at that. It's not something where, um, 
you know, fundamentally it's changing because of our rebalance. Uh, I think we continue to work very closely with ADB. Yeah. Kumar from Amnesty. Um, Scott, um, we are a little concerned that human rights is not seriously taken into account in this new emerging regional architecture. <coughs> As you are aware, the ASEAN human rights mechanism is extremely weak, even the administration came against it. Where does human rights fit into the new relationship and any particular steps you are taking? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Kumar. Uh, you know, I did talk about human rights uh, in my comments and the importance of it. It remains a very important part of American foreign policy everywhere in the world, and, and that's not changed by rebalance. Um, we continue to work on it, you know, in different ways in different countries, depending on the particular situation. I think one of the really interesting things is the rebalance and the efforts to build new partnerships is also creating opportunities to support people in the region who are doing good things to promote human rights and democracy. I would cite, again, going back to my Indonesian days, the Bali Democracy Forum, which I think is an excellent initiative uh, by, by the Indonesian government, which is now uh, attracting a lot of people, as well as doing uh, various programs, for example, supporting NGOs working together from various c countries to try to create more space and build the capacity of civil society, which, as you uh, know, is a hugely important part of human rights. And then, of course, there's regular discussions, uh, official discussions on our side uh, with governments about particular human rights concerns. So I, I think it remains a, a very important part of what we're trying to do. And uh, the rebalance includes um, a lot of opportunities to engage on a range of issues, including human rights. Thank you. Dong Hui Yu with China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. <coughs> Did you see any adjustment of U.S. rebalancing strategic under Secretary Kerry and Secretary Hegel. I mean, did you see any differences or any adjustment uh, that is different from the uh, policy or strategic under Secretary uh, Clinton and uh, Panita? And also, uh, okay, that's it. Thank you. Good. You know how short my mem how bad my memory is. I wouldn't be able to answer too. Um, thanks. Um, in in big picture terms, no, because this is a rebalance initiative under President Obama, and so important as as cabinet secretaries are, um, you know, it's this is a presidential initiative, and there's strong commitment from the top. Um, I, I guess, and and from everything I've seen, you know, Secretary Hagel was just out in the region. Was it last week or two weeks ago? I, I lost track. Um, and so uh, I don't think there's going to be any significant change. The details will change, you know, particular trips or particular things that they focus on. But the fundamental big picture of the rebalance, I don't think so, no. Thank you very much. My name is Jeannie Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. I um, thank you for talking about the TPP. And uh, you did mention the code of conduct. So my question has that two points. And you also just stressed the fact that the administration also focused on human rights. So I believe human rights has been the main issue for Vietnam to work with TPP. So would you let us know share with us where things are in the process of um, Vietnam engaging in TPP with all the violations of human rights recently happened right after President Tsang visit with President Obama. And I understand that the Prime Minister Nguyen Tân Dung is coming here soon. Would something be brought up, especially with the freedom of uh, internet, freedom of speech? And recently, freedom of religions, there are significant problems with quite many churches and um, pagoda and hoa hao, the Buddhism hoa hao in Vietnam, just within the last month. The second point is the COC, the Code of Conduct. And I think 
Dr. Campbell also emphasized the establishing of norms. And we do look forward to have a good code of conduct in the South China Sea. Recently, China has proposed a code of conduct in which they still claim the U-shaped map, or 80% of the South China Sea. Where um, do you see the administration take the position in that? Thank you. OK, um, thanks. I mean, TPP, I would really defer to my colleagues at USTR to go into the details of, U of, of TPP. I mean, it's a trade agreement. Um, there are aspects that cross over into things like labor rights and so on, and, and so those will be discussed fully in the TPP negotiations. On the broader issue of human rights with Vietnam, I mean, it's been, as you know, uh, since normalization and even before, it's been a topic we've regularly talked to the Vietnamese government about, uh, including when President Song was here. Uh, I know our embassy has gone in and talked about the recent internet uh, law, or I can't remember if it's a law or regulation. Um, uh, I, I can't speak to what will be on the agenda when Prime Minister Zoom uh, uh, comes, and we don't you know, have anything set yet. But I, what I can say is it comes up consistently in our meetings with the Vietnamese. Um, and then on the issue of the code of conduct, um, you know, this is what we have said is that the, we support the concept of a code of conduct really to establish the rules of the road, if you will, understanding that the actual resolution of the territorial disputes will take a long time and it's important to have rules until that is done. Uh, and it's really a, a, a negotiation between the ASEANs and the Chinese about the exact parameters of that. So we're supporting the concept and those negotiations and think they're very important, but really not going in and, and saying what the actual elements should be as long as it results in something that's, that works. Thank you. John Zan with CTI TV of Taiwan. Mr. Secretary, uh, where does Taiwan fit in this new uh, Asian architecture? And uh, how do you see the uh, trilateral relationship uh, between the United States, uh, China, and Taiwan? Thank you very much. Um, well, let, me, let me start by admitting that I am far from an expert on this subject, so I won't say a whole lot. Um, you know, the, our, our policy, our one, pol one China policy has not changed, uh, but obviously we continue to work very hard to promote uh, trade investment throughout the region with the region as, uh, and certainly welcome efforts to maintain good cross-strait relations. Uh, so it's important in that sense. Obviously, Taiwan, as one of the member economies of APEC, plays a very important role, which we highly value. Uh, so I would just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Emil Skoden, former State Department. Uh, your remarks on continuing U.S. engagement and commitment to the multilateral organizations in the region were very welcome. But I wonder if you could highlight maybe just one or two specific areas where you'd like to see improvements in that realm, things done differently or maybe even better in terms of individual organizations uh, or individual groupings, what they take on how they do their business, um, or in terms of more cooperation between those groupings. Thanks. I thought there was a CSIRS rule that former ambassadors weren't allowed to ask <laughs> questions, Emil. <laughs> um, that's a good question. I mean, it's, it's um, nothing jumps out at me as a, as a huge gap that, that is really crying to be filled in, in that sense. On the other hand, I'd say in almost every area, there's room for improvement. Um, so, uh, for example, there's a certain amount of overlap, as you well know, between some things that uh, ASEAN, ARF, APEC, EAS are, have all touched on, things like disaster relief, which everyone likes to work on. It's, it's, a, it's an issue that is both important and, generally speaking, somewhat less sensitive than other issues. I think there could be greater coordination so, and avoid, uh, avoidance of duplication in areas like that. 
and certainly on the economic side in addition to TPP. Uh, I think there's lots of opportunities, for example, in renewable energy uh, where we could be working together. That's why we launched the initiative last year, the U.S. OSEP uh, initiative on energy, but I think there's actually a lot more that could be done and uh, where we really need to work with the business community very closely. So I would, I would highlight that. Do we have time for one more question? Please, back in the back. Wait for the microphone, okay, please. I'm Yuan Mei Wong from Malaysian American Society. I have a question here about the language we use when we talk about the region. I felt currently the whole forum, the language is very positive and very prescriptive, such as talking about Americans' contribution in the region. But however, in this region, uh, there is uneven development in each nation states and also conflict of interest. I just wonder the perspective of conflict and inequality in power. Uh, how can that be taken into consideration when we talk about economic integration and also political security? Such as an example is like, I heard that the proposal of US-China um, program in Burma, something is worrying is about the Straits of Malacca. If they were to build a, pa a can uh, canal uh, to contact the inroad, of business investment in Burma that will bypass the whole Strait of Malacca. So what will happen to Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore? And would that, like the Panama Canal in South America, seriously change the dynamic of economic activities in the region? Thank you. That's a hard question. <laughs> um, uh, let, me, let me try to address it a little bit. Um, I mean, it's not – first let me say that these are issue, issues of equity and security and, conf, and, and minimizing the risk of conflict, you know, have been critical to our foreign policy for a long time. And, and with the, the rebalance doesn't change that. It may, may be more focused overall on issues, but, you know, th these are longstanding issues. I think the issues of development and sustainable development and, um, you know, uh, inclusive growth and development are huge issues, I mean, not just for the United States, but for the world, and are addressed in, in a whole range of oil, ranging from G20 to certainly APEC. And we are always looking for areas to, uh, ways to try to uh, increase uh, the number of people that benefit from the economic growth, working with our partners through uh, liberalized trade, increased competition, reducing barriers to starting businesses, for example, these sorts of things. So that continues, and, and APEC is, is cri uh, critical in that. Um, and, uh, you know, similarly with conflict, there's a wide range of areas. I'm not familiar with exactly the, the point on the bypassing the Malacca Straits, but uh, I mean, I, I think there can be a lot of views about the best way to promote act trade and economic development, what projects make sense and what they don't. I guess what we would say is that what's useful is to have full and transparent discussions about them with all the stakeholders so that whenever decisions are made, they're based on input from the stakeholders. So, for example, in the Mekong area, we've been working with our partners in the region uh, in the question of dams on the Mekong comes up. Uh, not necessarily to say this dam's good, this dam's bad, but to say there ought to be a process that brings in the views and includes the views of the various stakeholders and weighs the pros and cons. In the end, governments will make decisions uh, based on what they perceive to be in their national interest, but we think the international fora, the multilateral fora, can be great ways to encourage this kind of transparency reaching out to the various stakeholders, and we'll continue to try to do that. I hope that addresses your question a little bit. Thank you. Uh, we're going to segue into the, the next uh, panel, uh, which will focus on the economic uh, aspects of the APEC and the East Asia Summit. So please, I invite you all to join me in, in thanking Ambassador Marcial for his <laughs> speech. Thank you. And